Good afternoon. Thank you for sticking around. Saturday afternoon. Can't imagine there can be anything more fun or anything to do on a Saturday afternoon. So as I was just pulling this up, I realized that uh, you know I put some work into updating this presentation and everything, but I actually forgot to update my title. So it's actually wrong on the slide. My title is now Director of Training and Research at Bio. It was see Director of Clinical Services, but uh, we realized that training and research was uh, much more descriptive of what I actually do there. <clears throat> and, you know, like uh, landscape architects do when they kind of see where people walk on the grass and then they build a good path there. So that's kind of what we did. <clears throat> so uh, I'm going to warn you up front that uh, this is not really going to be much about autism spectrum disorder per se in this talk. As you can see by the title, it's, it is about APA. Obviously, APA is often associated with you know, interventions and support for people that have ASD. Uh, but I'm going to be talking more generally about APA, so hopefully after this talk, you'll have a bit, bit, bit more understanding about what the field is in general. But on the other hand, I would be more than happy to stay a little bit afterwards and answer some more specific questions that you might have about APA and autism spectrum disorder. And I could even give you my email address if you follow up on something. So, but I will men mention autism spectrum disorder among uh, several other things. <clears throat> so uh, the reason really why I give this talk, and I try to give it whenever I have the opportunity, is the fact that it annoys me somewhat irrationally, you know, that ABA is often referred to as treatment or therapy, when in, in fact, especially in, in relation to uh, services for individuals. Uh, whereas, in fact, what is being done is interventions that are based in the science of ABA. So that's a subtle distinction, but to me and others in the field, it's a pretty important one. Because ABA is a lot more general than that. Uh, but we've kind of dug our own grave there in, in the field, and we haven't done a good job of educating the public. And uh, also, the fact is that uh, when uh, services are covered, for instance, by you know, private health insurance and Medicaid, is, it is referred to as ABA, you know. So it's not surprising that people would use it as a synonymous with treatment or intervention uh, procedures or methods. Um, <coughs> as such, I think it's safe to say, and this has changed a lot in the 20 years since I started getting into the field, uh, has become a gold standard approach to, to help individuals with ASD achieve their potential. Um, and it's kind of the first thing that is often brought up uh, when somebody gets that diagnosis. So I'm going to try to explain what APA is, broadly speaking, and uh, I'll try to make this not too boring, um, because it gets a little dry and philosophical sometimes, I'm, I'll skip over those parts quickly and get to the interesting parts hopefully. But uh, APA is the application, basically, branch of the science of behavior analysis. Behavior analysis is the science of behavior. And what does behavior analysis do? It studies the influence on the, on the environment of, on behavior, broadly speaking. Behavior being the subject matter. So that's, you know, I'm going to speak in generalities here. Just maybe we'll try a little bit to make a point. But for more traditional, because, you know, behavior analysis uh, originated within psychology, academic psychology. And uh, the more traditional viewpoint in psychology is one um, where behavior is not the subject matter, where behavior is just evidence for uh, cognitive structures, and you know, uh, such as short-term or long-term memory, personality, and so forth. Right. So those kind of academic psychologists might measure behavior, but they do so in order to make inferences about you know um, uh, the psyche, you know, cognition, and so forth. Uh, in, ABA, in behavior analysis and APA, behavior is the subject matter that we're interested in studying. And we study the influence mostly of the environment, but also as it interacts with biology and other relevant variables. <clears throat> so there are three branches of behavior analysis. There's the philosophical or conceptual analysis, behaviors. I'm not going to talk much about that here, I'm just going to touch up on it. Then there's the basic research called the experimental analysis of behavior. And then there's the application, which is applied behavior analysis. So that's what we do in practice. Now, all of those principles that we base our, our uh, <coughs> interventions on come from the basic research, experimental analysis of behavior. Right? 
by the way, you cannot raise your hand and ask questions anytime throughout this presentation. Don't have to wait until the end. So the practice of applied behavior analysis has becoming, it really is very pretty new. It's really like within the uh, last 20 to 30 years that's become formalized uh, as, a, as its own discipline, its own professional discipline. Before that, there were people doing behavior analysis stuff, but it, and there still are uh, within other disciplines, you know, education, psychology, and so forth, and so on. That still exists, but now behavior analysis has become its own professional discipline, and not in the least because of the creation of the Behavior Analyst Certification Board, the BACB, uh, which is, you know, like any other certification board governed <coughs> by, you know, uh, laws and regulations. And I always find that funny, this maybe it's just me that they're actually a certification board that certifies certification boards. <laughs> so they're certified by that certification board. Yeah. Um, so, if you are certified, you're a board certified behavior analyst. So what does that mean? It means that you meet minimal standards, really. It means that you passed an exam, it means that you've gotten supervised experience hours working with humans implementing those services that are part of ABA. And uh, you have to main, to maintain that certification. You have to get, you know, be in good standing. You have to follow professional ethical codes, and you have to get continuing education credits. So that that's become very standardized and codified. And in recent years, um, licensure of behavior analysis has started to happen. And now, I can't remember. It's more than half the states, like close to 30 of the states, that have licensure. For Virginia was pretty early in that, that process. So we've had licensure for now, what, eight, nine years, something like that. So that means that, you know, it doesn't mean that you can't do behavior analysis stuff without a license. You can, you can use positive reinforcement without a license, right? But you cannot sell your services and call them, you're, I'm a behavior analyst and I'm providing services as a behavior analyst without being licensed, right? So, um, <clears throat> get a license, you have to have board certification and then full of, fulfill a few other requirements. So that's, uh, what, what is the benefit of that? I mean, consumer protection is really one of the major benefits of that. So there is protection against people misrepresenting uh, their credentials uh, and about against doing unethical things uh, and practicing really without having the qualifications. A little bit of the history. So um, this is, you know, it sometimes turns people off when they learn about, you know, all those principles come from, you know, laboratory research and Skinner boxes with rats and pigeons. Um, yeah, Skinner was the founder of behavior analysis. A uh, lot of, you know, he didn't do any research with humans. You know, all of his writings were extrapolations about how these basic principles, which is reinforcement and stimulus control and motivating operations, don't have to understand. What, they, what, what those are right now. I'm not getting into that detail. It's kind of giving a general overview. Um, but extrapolation of how those might work with humans. Uh, when you think about it, though, that's very similar to how any other science has progressed. They typically, science has typically progressed from research on simple uh, processes, simple um, responses, uh, with, with, uh, sometimes with uh, non-human animals, and then progress to something more complex. Um, most complex sciences are built on simpler elements, and that's really all what behavior analysis is. You know, computers, it's all just ones and zeros, right? But they build up to something much more complex. Um, so that is progress to applications with humans. And the basic behavioral principles, and if you're interested in that, you can take our course sequence here. Uh, UVA and the BACB course sequence, and at least one student in, the, in, that, in, here, in here today, um, such as reinforcement, stimulus control, and motivating operations. So what are these base, basic principles do? They, they describe particular ways in which events in the environment influence behavior, both events that happen before behavior, after behavior, historical events. Um, in and of themselves, they're kind of simple, but when they start interacting, it's pretty complex. It's not that easy. Uh, like a lot of other sciences. And then we have the procedures and interventions based on the basic behavioral procedures. 
And those are such as differential reinforcement, discrimination training, shaping, prompting and prompt training, antecedent intervention. A lot of those are used in other disciplines, in particular education. You know, so ed education and behavior analysis have a really you know, good marriage, in, in my opinion. <clears throat> and then we have those two different kinds of behaviors. You have behavior that is directly influenced by the environment. So when you have a rat in the Skinner box and they press the lever and you deliver a pellet, you know, foot reinforcer, and over time they learn only to press when the light is on because that's the only time that the foot is available, you know, call that stimulus control. That's contingency shaped behavior. There's a consequence of behavior, reinforcement that is influencing that. But we all know that a lot of human behavior is not that simple, right? A lot of it is rule governed or verbally mediated, you know. We're be behaving the way we do because we have those rules about how to behave. Uh, we're, we're talking to ourselves, we're talking to others. Now, that behavior actually uh, obeys the same principles according to behavior analysis. They're just a lot more complex because that behavior in and of itself, what we, the rules we generate and how we self-talk and so forth, that in and of itself is also shaped by the environment and how effective it is in the environment, what follows the behavior and so forth. But the reason I'm emphasizing that is that uh, behavior analysis, even though we focus on those relatively simple things that happen before and after behavior, we're not ignoring that more complex verbal behavior. We do account for that as well. So some, some assumptions of behavior analysis. One assumption is that environment and biological variables interact. Right? I think that's something that everybody, everybody agrees with. Right? Uh, it's, it's pretty obvious. But sometimes behavior analysis is accused of ignoring biology or genetic, genetic influences and so, so forth. It does not. Uh, it's just not our field. But that's why it's important to work with other disciplines, you know, such as medical personnel, uh, neuroscientists, and so forth. A person's history influences current behavior. People, are do, people do things they do for a reason, you know. We often see behavior that is pretty bizarre, you know. About 50% of individuals that have an autism diagnosis have, <coughs> one time or another, significant problem behavior. Uh, aggression, for instance. Um, not everybody that has a diagnosis, but a significant number. That behavior in the moment might look very bizarre. Uh, and unexplainable and come out of nowhere. But there is a reason why it's happening, and that reason is the history of the individual, what has been reinforced in the past, uh, what kind of skills they have acquired in the past or haven't acquired in the past. Uh, from that person's perspective, it's actually rational behavior. And we have to assume that it is rational behavior from their perspective in order to understand why it's happening and to be able to intervene on it. From their perspective, and that's what a lot of that's what a lot of the strength of ABA comes from. Uh, really focusing on that, this behavior makes sense due to these variables, Influ uh, influence of both biological and environmental variables, and we have to just discover what those are, and then we can help that individual overcome that challenge. So complex outcomes can be explained by relatively simple principles. When they interact, they are complex. Um, I was going to say something very profound about that, but it just escaped me. <laughs> yeah, I'll come back to it. I think, I don't know if you've heard controversial statements about it. Yeah, I do, you know, because I'm in the field. Um, but I think much of the controversy regarding ABA is a result of conflating principles and procedures. And what are the, the principles are those general principles that govern all behaviors, such as positive reinforcement, if something is followed by a positive reinforcer is more likely to happen in the future. Uh, that's a principle, that's, that's a fact, you know, it's an undeniable fact, you know, it's been shown over and over in research. It's like the weather, you know, denying that is like denying the weather or gravity, you know. Uh, it's fatal, you know, to, to, well, maybe not fatal to, uh, sometimes it can be, I guess, to ignore reinforcement. So that's a principle, it happens. What about a particular <laughs> procedure that uses positive reinforcement? Well, that can be, done well, it can be done badly, it can be done ethically, it can be done unethically, right? Just like any other 
profession that serve, serves people. Um, medical science has a lot of examples of really good and ethical practices and some not so good and unethical practices. Same with ABA. So the point is that behavioral principles describe how the environment influences behavior. So they're neither good or bad, they just are, like gravity or the weather. They're just there and we ignore them at our peril. Um, the procedures and interventions that are based on behavioral principles, well, they should be applied in a moral <coughs> and professional manner, which I think is a lot better shape now than it was because of this professionalization of behavioral analysis, because we have the BCBA, because we have licensure, because we have a strict professional ethical code based on that. Uh, but it is true that back in the day there were some unethical punishment procedures used in the name of behavioral science, right? And I think a lot of, maybe some old school um, professors, for instance, for instance uh, might still just be thinking of that uh, history and not be aware of the uh, uh, more recent history of behavioral analysis and therefore kind of, it's a bad name in certain circles, which is unfortunate. So, uh, some myths about behavior analysis. By the way, we're doing really well on time. So, uh, <laughs> any questions you have, I'm sure we'll have <laughs> time for. ABA is only a treatment approach. ABA is only for autism and problem behavior. ABA is not for everybody. I've heard that many, many, many times. But it's not true. I'm going to show that in a very dramatic fact fashion, but it's not just by striking through it. it covers it. All right. ABA is the application of the science of behavior, not the treatment. Treatments are based on ABA. That's a, you know, if, if nothing else you get out of this talk, I want you to get that out of it. ABA, treatments are based on ABA. Uh, there are interventions based on ABA for any area where behavior is relevant. They're just a lot less well known. And sometimes they're not even called ABA. They're based on ABA, but they're called something different. Um, Principles of behavior apply to everybody. They, uh, we use them for ourselves, and or we try to. It's very difficult to use them yourself uh, and on each other. So, so some of the examples of practice of ABA, and some of these are actually relevant to to uh, you know autism spectrum disorder as well. For instance, organizational behavior management, which uh, focuses on more like systems level analysis, safety in the workplace, staff training, performance management. Now, we use organizational behavior management procedures routinely in <coughs> some services organizations. Uh, and we might use them also when we are doing like job training and, and stuff like that for, for individuals with diagnosis. Um, there are lots of educational practices, instructional design and so forth, that are either wholly or partially based on behavior analysis or at least very consistent with it, such as direct instruction, precision teaching, Personal systems of instruction, which is a system that is not very well known to date, but has influenced a lot of computer-based instruction that's based on mastery uh, and uh, uh, breaking the content into small uh, bits of information and um, self-paced instruction. You know, a lot of that came out of behavior analysis, early research behavior analysis. Uh, preschool life skills program I've been involved in, embedded in naturalistic teaching. People often, don't often think about that in terms of ABA, but it, you know, a lot of that is also based on ABA principles. There are gener general clinical problems, perhaps not surprising given that uh, ABA came out of psychology. Interventions for tick disorders, the best established non-medicine, you know, medicine, the, the interventions that are not you know, uh, drugs, uh, for tick disorders are behavioral. Um, and they've been shown as such in you know, ran randomized clinical trials over and over. Uh, there's something called acceptance and commitment therapy for anxiety that is becoming like mainstream now, Direc directly out of behavioral analysis. You know, the behavioral analyst invented it. Uh, behavioral activation for depression, one of the best uh, interventions for depression is getting people up and going and doing stuff. You know. That's, uh, that's, that also came out of uh, from behavioral researchers. Um, behavior management, parent-child interactions, good behavior game, uh, underutilized, but 
very effective for classroom management, behavioral contracts. Very interesting research that uh, interventions that are becoming more popular now for sleep disorders um, that are pretty effective. That uh, are is one of the best examples of combining uh, knowledge from uh, medicine uh, and biology with behavior analysis. And well, you probably know this, but sleep disorders are very, very common with individuals that have special disorders. <coughs> um, so we, we end up doing a lot of that also in, the, in our practice with health disorders. <coughs> now, more generally, on a societal level, um, some pretty promising programs uh, for substance abuse and gambling that are based on contingency management. What, what are those things? They're basically based on the simple idea. Let's try to make it pay off not to do those things. How can we shift the contingency such that you get more out of not doing those things than doing them? You know, basically trying to override those contingencies that maintain, uh, for instance, gambling. Um, and uh, it, it's uh, pretty effective you know, in combination with other things. Sports performance and coaching. That's a marriage made in heaven because sports people, a lot of them, love measurement and stats. We do too, right? So very objective. It's, it's very objective when you score a goal and when you don't score a goal. The, the yards you get in football, right? So it goes together really well. <clears throat> Physical activity and exercise, all sorts of uh, reinforcement-based programs to increase that. Very promising. Community intervention for sustainable practices. That's a uh, Small field, but getting bigger. Uh, traffic safety and uh, aviation safety. Uh, there's quite a lot of um, signage and checklists and other stuff in safety that is directly based on behavior analysis that is used, is used routinely. Um, and the kind, the way the way uh, intersections are designed, stop signs, and so forth. A lot of that came from behavioral researchers. Um, tolerating medical procedure procedures. That's something we often do in uh, ASD interventions as well. And obviously this is kind of more well known, application of behavior analysis, intervention and education with ASD population, DD population in general, uh, development disabilities, uh, working on language development um, in conjunction with speech language pathologists usually, uh, social skills, feeding issues, and kind of our bread and butter from the beginning, severe problem behavior, including self-injury and aggression. So that's where we get at least I get called into action most often. That's what we're best known for. And I think this next slide is why is APA mostly known for applications of ASD and DD? And I should add severe problem behavior. Because the need and results have been most dramatic in these areas. So if you have very severe, um, I mean, you know, the public doesn't see the most severe instances of self injury and aggression, um, unfortunately. Well, unfortunately, I don't know. Uh, they, they, this, this problem kind of gets hidden a little bit. I think a lot of you know, know that. And uh, I worked in um, with my postdoctoral fellowship in um, uh, at the Johns Hopkins, uh, Kennedy Creek at the Johns Hopkins Medical School. They have a unit there called the Neurobehavioral Unit, which is an inpatient unit for uh, mostly adults, but also children uh, with development disabilities who have the most severe cases of self-injury, you know, life-threatening cases. Uh, and uh, very severe aggression. And uh, nobody else, I, I feel very confident in saying this, this might f sound arrogant, but nobody else has really gotten anywhere with those <coughs> issues except behavior analysts, right? Um, without just drugging people into a daze, right? That's the only alternative. So, and that's why a lot of people in the field, because this is a very small field, that's kind of drawn to that, because that's where you get asked to do things. Um, so, so I think uh, ABA is relevant to everyday problems. So a few myths that are false. AB only works for simple responses to problems. Here there are a multitude of applications. AP has proven to be relevant. It's definitely not the case based on research. Uh, we don't really have time to get into this conceptual part, but sometimes we are accused of denying thoughts and emotions. Uh, that's a misunderstanding. The reason for that is that we kind of we think about these things differently than mainstream psychologists. You know, we don't think about them as much as 
And I realize the uh, irony of me using the word think, but I can't avoid it. Um, we don't think about them in terms of being the ultimate causes of behavior. They're just part of what happens. They're part of what needs to be explained. Whatever the person is thinking and feeling, it enters into the causal chain, uh, but it needs to be explained just as much as any other behavior and explained through the same variables, biological, environmental. That's how we look at it. Uh, and neuroscientists that think the same way can collaborate with us on uh, explaining behavior fully. So we do not ignore biological influences. Nature and nurture interact. Uh, it's pointless to try ask the question about nature versus nurture. It's a completely meaningless question. They don't exist without each other. Um, this is a common myth, extrinsic rewards undermine intrinsic rewards. I could talk about that for a day. There's a lot of research on it. The short answer is yes, but only if you do it wrong. Right? The reason why it happens is because in some arbitrary research, people have started reinforcing behaviors that kids are already doing, like you know, coloring. They enjoy coloring, they're doing it already. And he throws some arbitrary reinforcers on top of it. Oh, great, I'm getting tokens or money or whatever, or candy. And then they take the candy away. They're pissed off because they lost their candy, so they stop coloring. Right? Is that undermining the intrinsic rewards? No. This is the, it's a, oh, called the over-justification effect. You kind of go back to the low baseline. But after a little while, they start coloring again. You know, it goes away like that. So only if you do it wrong. Uh, that's an, another myth you sometimes see. Um, ABA studies, you know, aversive control and co coercion. Uh, it teaches us actually to recognize it and potentially avoid it. An ethical code prohibits us from relying on aversive control. Uh, <coughs> another myth, ABA is restrictive and undermines freedom and independence. Uh, on the contrary, the ethical code directs us to use ABA to increase skills that lead to independence and increase quality of life. Uh, another myth, skills learned through ABA do not generalize and maintain. Uh, there's a kernel of truth to that, but it's not just applicable to ABA, it's applicable to any learning. Because learning does not magically generalize uh, and maintain over time. There needs to be something in the environment that actually supports the skills. Uh, and if you teach skills that are actually really important for the individual in their environment and, loosely speaking, pay off for them, then they are going to maintain and generalize. So uh, thankfully, ABA is focusing more and more over time on research on how the, the gains can actually be maintained and generalized. ABA leads to road learning, same thing as uh, the previous point, only if it's done badly. Uh, if you're teaching skills that are not meaningful to the individual, that are not meaningful in the context in which they exist, then yeah, it can lead to road learning. What do you mean by road learning? Something that is just kind of talking like a parrot. It's not functional. It's not, you know, um, related to anything. But notice, though, that sometimes that can be the first step of learning. Sometimes that can be the first step. Like when I was teaching, uh, sorry, learning how to play the guitar, some of the stuff that I learned initially was pretty rote. But then when I learned more stuff, I learned how to combine those scales and notes and everything into other stuff. Explaining this very eloquently. Um, <laughs> and now I can kind of improvise. I wouldn't say I want, would want you to hear what I'm improvising, but at least I enjoy it. So. ABA is not just discrete trial and instruction. Naturalistic teaching was pioneered by ABA researchers. ABA is not a fad, it's been around for 50 years, or even though it was just professionalized 20 years ago. And ABA offers a multitude of pragmatic principles. It's consistent with other established fields. It can work well with others. Prove that as a via uh, working with educators, so <coughs> with SLP, so um, based in science, relies on constant critical evaluation. Um, yeah, we try to improve lives. We abide by a strict professional ethical code. So now that I've spent 40 minutes um, defending against possibly imaginary attacks. <laughs> but believe me, I have heard all of those things repeatedly. But I'm just basically using this as an opportunity to kind of educate about the field in general. So it's one framing device to do so. So that's, that about does it. I'm, thinking, I'm out of time, so thank you.